Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Good Fellow webinar on lower back pain, when is conservative or surgical treatment required? This webinar is kindly supported by Mercy Ascot today. My name is Dr Helen Filcher and I will be moderating this webinar. As usual, we welcome your questions this evening and uh, if you can put them through the Q&A selection at the bottom of your screen, we'll aim to get through as many as we can in the time available to us. Presenting tonight, we have Dr Girish Kandji, a musculoskeletal pain specialist, honorary associate professor at Auckland University, chairperson of the New Zealand Pain Foundation and editor of the Australasian Musculoskeletal Medicine. We also have Dr. John Ferguson, an orthopedic spinal surgeon in Auckland who sits in several committees with the Scoliosis Research Society and on the program committee for the ICOS Scoliosis subgroup. Thank you, Girish and John, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to let Girish uh, take it away with um, conservative management. Thank you, Alan. So what we're going to do today is firstly look at the influences of spinal pain. And that really leads us to management as well and the influences. So firstly, we've got the brain. And really, when we think about symptoms, we are talking about action potentials within the brain. In the sensory cortex, we're talking about pain. So the reticular formation could be insomnia, the amygdala, panic attack, anxiety, um, and aggression. And in other parts of the brain, the motor cortex, muscle tension. And probably the levels of action potentials will equate to the levels of symptoms. Now, the four things that, well, there's more too, but the four major things that influence the action potentials in the brain are the stress chemicals, noradrenaline, serotonin. And what happens here is they attach throughout the brain to receptors and produce action potentials. And this is how stress can influence pain by increasing action potentials within the sensory cortex. Um, another influence is the electrical channels within the sensory cortex. In patients with migraine, those electrical channels are different. They've been typed and they have different ATPases and actually different structural elements. And the end result is there's more action potentials for any given input. And what this means is people with migraine are sensitive to light, sound, pain, touch, and smell. The research shows that people with migraine are 6.6 .6 times more at risk of fibromyalgia, five times more at risk of chronic complex regional pain syndrome, and three times the risk of any musculoskeletal pain. And what it really means is if I have a damaged structure in my knee, and I don't have migraine, and someone with migraine has a damaged structure in the knee, which is equivalent, and we go for a walk together, they're much more likely to get pain than I am. Now, pressure. As we know, pressure affects spinal pain. And this is a graph sort of showing different pressures, lying down to leaning forward sitting, which is the single worst thing you can pretty much do, except for lifting. And what pressure does is drive action potentials from the body. And the way I put it to patients is that we have bones and washers. We have discs in the spine and cartilage in our joints. And when our discs or cartilage deteriorate or get damaged, pressure often creates action potentials and they go to the brain. Now, lastly, the body structures. And here we see on, the, on my right, you see a, a quite a good MRI scan with nice hydrated discs and good disc heights. And we could pretty much say that those discs look pretty good. Next to that, we see a spine with sort of dehydrated discs, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three narrow discs. And in fact, there are four levels of modic changes. That's actually my spine. And about a decade ago, I was leg pressing 200 kilograms. The lever slipped. It basically crushed my back a little, and I had pain every day for two years, waking at around 2 a.m. And it was sort of six, seven, eight out of 10 with tingling down to the toes. And that got me very acutely interested in low back pain, actually, <laughs> surprisingly. 
Um, I have zero pain today as I sit here and I haven't had back pain for around eight years now. And next door to me is someone who's even worse than me in terms of structure. So here we see fusions occurred naturally, mark narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. That person also has zero pain, right? And this is really quite important actually, um, because when we start ranking, what is the most important factor for the generation of action potentials in the brain, it's actually migraine genetics and stress first. So your brain is the most important determinant of your pain experience. The next most important is posture and pressure and activity. And really, I would say the last determinant is the structure. And that's quite a an interesting way to look at it. And, and I've really only come across this actually preparing for this talk, um, that realization. Now, if we look at stress, the stress, stress system, what we're generally looking at is autonomic dysfunction. We're looking at a raised sympathetic tone and a reduced parasympathetic tone. And that's sort of what happens with people with chronic pain. And what that does, is basically drive more action potentials in the brain from stress chemicals. And what we've found, and I'll start with this one. If we look at a model to account for symptoms of stress, and I'll include pain in there, um, insomnia, anxiety, depression, pain. What basically happens is trauma, intergenerational, intrauterine, childhood, adult, create physiological changes where they increase the size of the stress brain. So, and that includes the pituitary gland, uh, the adrenal gland in the body. They shrink the hippocampus, giving rise to brain fog. They basically soup up our stress nervous system. Now, what that, and then what we've got is life. We've got job, family, financial, personal, and then pain on top of that and they drive stress chemicals, and then they create symptoms. So we're sort of not just, you know, and we're often sort of up here managing people, whereas really we need to go a bit deeper to basically make long-term changes to people. And as I explained soon, it's habits and tablets, and that's one of my favorite phrases. So what the research finds in depression, which is a stress-related condition, is that there's 70% the adrenal gland is 70% bigger in people depressed than non-depressed looking at MRI scans. The pituitary gland is 30% bigger on MRI scans in a randomized controlled trial. Now, the other factor is that GABA is basically produced in the brain and the GABA receptors, 20% of every neuron in the brain produces GABA, which turns the brain electricity off. Okay, and that's a large chunk of your brain just designed to suppress electricity. And what the studies find is that's 52% reduced in chronic stress conditions. So not only have we got the souped up stress system, but we've also got the off switch basically depleted. Now, the intergenerational trauma is really interesting. And I'll just talk a little bit about it. And this is why we often see people who have had insomnia, anxiety, depression in the past, when they get a chronic pain condition, they tend to do worse and they're more seen in pain clinics with ongoing problems. So what happens with intergenerational trauma, and I'll put it the reverse. If someone basically plays cricket for New Zealand and they're training and they train hours a day, their motor cortex grows and their cerebellum grows. The parts of the brain subserving um, coordination, muscle strength, in fact, grow and become more efficient. Perversely, if you have generations of stress and you arrive from, say, have a history from Nazi Germany and you're a Jewish person, or even uh, people from India, and I come from the Gujarat and my grandfather came in the 1940s, and in 1890 to 1900s, about 15, 20% of Gujaratis died of famine. And that really set up a line of uh, generations of poverty. 
and those sort of um, and that basically goes into your genetics and gets passed on in certain parts of your brain being more active. And that's the reason why um, people who are high level sports who play for New Zealand, they often have children that end up playing for New Zealand as well. There is, in fact, uh, a good intergenerational sort of genetics that are passed down. Now, the other thing that is not quite understood is that pain is a volume, and that's the best way to look at it. And it may start like a golf ball, but it can end up like a beach ball. And what this means is that there are many structures in the lumbar spine, lumbar sacral region, that can give you back pain and leg pain. And, and I think we often think very singularly. And here's um, a person with a SI joint showing edema, and that can give you lumbar sacral pain. That can go right down to your foot, but it doesn't have to be compression of a nerve root. And the same with discs, facet joints, and the hip. Now, there's other sources of lumbar sacral pain as well, some gen congenital changes, pseudoarthroses, sometimes symphysis pubis, but I suspect these are pretty much the bulk of our patients. Now, a person can have one of these problems or actually four. And the way we distinguish them is by asking biomechanical questions. So if someone says to me with sort of this disc change on the scan that, oh, doc, my pain's four out of 10 when I'm in the consult room. If I sit for an hour watching a movie, my pain goes up to eight. You know, I'm instantly thinking possibly disc, right? I am, so that's veers me in that direction. And then the patient goes, oh, if I go for a walk around, my pain gets quite a lot better. If I lie down, it's better. So that's the biomechanical sort of barrage of questions which I, I, I sort of ask. And if, if this person said to me, oh yeah, I, I'm five out of 10, but if I go for a walk for half an hour, it basically goes to 10 out of 10. I'm thinking, hold on here. Every step a person takes, their pressure in their spine changes every step. And hence walking is generally fairly good for people with disc pain. There are exceptions, but it's a, it's a reasonably good general rule. If someone with hip pain, you know, would more likely say, when I sit in a car, when I get out of the car, when I get up off a chair, uh, when I walk, it hurts more, and it's, you know, less when I'm not walking, then I might be thinking sort of more hip. There is crossover. So, and sometimes people have both, and you might figure one out, then you might investigate the other, Facet joints, bending, twisting. It's almost like they're designed to stop us twirling right around and also going backwards. And, you know, quite often I'll get them to bend backwards and sideways. And if they say, oh, that really makes my pain from three to seven, eight, and it's quite sharp. If they've got a rather big lordosis, they're pretty much likely to have a facet joint contribution to their pain. Now, the SI joint is... It's a weight bearing joint. And the best case to illustrate this I ever had was the only person that's ever come to me in a wheelchair at the age of 30. And I thought, this is, you know, this is unusual. Well, in fact, I've never seen it in 20 years. And I said, okay, well, and he sits there and goes, fine while I sit. And then he got up and I got him to stand on one leg and he couldn't do it. He stood on the other leg fine. Um, at Mercy, I basically got him to have a scan straight away. I said, look, I rang up the radiologist and they scanned him immediately because, you know, 30 year olds in wheelchairs is odd. Um, and he came back with this picture. And so this illustrates quite nicely that the SI joint is a weight bearing joint. And typically if it's causing pain, it should be a little bit worse standing walking. Now, if we look at the contributions of pain, you know, the first thing we want to do is reduce action potentials in the brain, right? And it's habits and tablets. So tablets 
I'll talk about them first. They attach to the brain spinal cord, reduce action potentials. They actually bind to them. The prostaglandins, uh, you know, they bind to all the receptors. Um, and, and that's how they actually work. It's, it's quite simple. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not specific just for the sensory cortex. So those side effects we call of sedation are not actually, they're actually real effects, but just in different parts of the brain we don't quite want. And really it's trial and error. Like we just have, you know, no clues as to whether this tablet is good or bad for someone until they actually try it. And we do get a lot of patients asking us, hey, look, doc, is that tablet going to be good for me or not? And I, I just say, look, clearly we don't know. We need to try it and see how you get on. Now, the other thing is the best we can expect is a reduction in pain, maybe one or two out of 10. It's rare, but it can happen that it will obliterate their pain. And if it does, they're quite fortunate. But we must tell patients that what we're looking for is if you're six, seven out of 10, you're distressed. But hey, if you get back to five, you sort of might cope with that a bit better. Now, the types of tablets, you know, we've got the sort of what we call the pain modifying tablets. And really, they're probably, you know, there's the gabapentin and pregabalin type, there's the sedative types, amitriptyline, um, um, you know, some of the anti epileptics, things like cotiapine, et cetera, promethazine. They sort of, they help sleep. Now, one of the very, very important things for all human beings is to sleep. We produce around six hormones when we sleep and two or three of them are produced in the last two hours of sleep. So in the first six hours, we produce 50% and in the last two hours, we produce 50%. So cortisol being one of them. And if we don't produce that extra 50%, we won't wake like a box of birds. And then cortisol goes down all day till about nine o'clock, you're sleepy and the levels are near zero. And so sleep is profoundly important for human beings. If we don't sleep, we get increased risks two or three times of dementia, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, early death, disability from heart disease and hypertension, and you just feel generally miserable. So one of the problems with sedative tablets is tolerance. Now we have many different types of receptors. You know, we've got hormone receptors. They don't generally have tolerance. All the stress chemical receptors have tolerance. The opioid receptors have tolerance. Now, I'm not that fussed about addiction personally, because you know you can prescribe medicines. They don't have to go on the street and rob a liquor store to get it. So the addiction's not, for, to me, a big deal. But the problem really is tolerance, because with tolerance, you give them a tablet every day, and then it stops working, and then you double the dose, and the unwanted effects increase, et cetera, et cetera. I never ever give the same sedative tablet in a row. And from for the last two years, I've been giving tablet A for day one, tablet B for day two, and tablet C for day three. So I'll give amitriptyline, promethazine, melatonin, quetiapine, um, zopiclone. It doesn't matter too much on the tablet as long as a tablet helps people. Now, what this has done has been that people for two years now have taken the same low dose, half to one, and slept most nights. Uh, and they, they, they have, I've never had to increase the dose once we've got them at a certain dose that works. And after two years, it's still going strong for those who still need it. And some people, let's face it, are just going to need it because their pain's so bad, you know, or other factors. And so that's a really good way. Now, the only painkiller that doesn't exhibit tolerance is medicinal cannabis. It is a retrograde mode of action. And I've got 100 people who take it for sleep and pain. It is, I suspect, going to be the single biggest use for medicinal cannabis is going to be sleep. And they take sort of 0.25 of uh, 2.5 to 5 milligrams THC CBD 
um, and they've been going the longest is probably three years. And, you know, like, so that is something um, that I think is, is extremely good, useful for, for people with chronic pain, actually. So I think the main message for tablets is alternate sedatives. That way we won't get the tolerance and we stay on low doses and people can still sleep. And I think medicinal cannabis is going to be very useful in this space and has been in my practice for the last couple of years. Now the mantra is habits and tablets. And the research shows that heat, meditation, exercise, Tai Chi and yoga all reduce sympathetic tone and increase parasympathetic tone. Heat is number one for many reasons. A, because it's the most effective method. And this is why people in Fiji are relaxed and people in New Zealand, we have a very high suicide rate, much higher than Mexico. And you've probably got more chance of dying from a gunshot wound in Mexico than suicide. So heat basically dilates blood vessels, sends messages to the brain to reduce the output of noradrenaline. And that's how it actually works. There may be other mechanisms, depletion of second messengers as well. 20 minutes, four days a week is a minimum dose. And the good thing about taking you know, habits is that you're going to have less action potentials and you're going to use less tablets. So I think, you know, and it's something that, you know, this is what I counsel my patients on, that let's find you a habit that doesn't hurt. So, and I, I implore the general practitioners and others out there, but do not ask patients to walk for exercise if it hurts. That is a no return game. You know, if they go for a walk and their pain is five and at the end it's eight, they're just gonna have to pop a pill. Much better to ask them to try different things and find something that doesn't hurt. And heat is really good because anyone can sit in a spa, bath or sauna, and you can even lie down in a sauna in some of the swimming pools. So it's a sort of zero gravity event. Um, and the benefits are stunning. In my PhD, I did a randomized controlled trial of sauna bathing 20 minutes, three times a week for eight weeks for chronic tension time headache with around 50% having marked reductions, or almost absences of the tension type headaches, which was 24 out of 28 days on average. So it's, it's extremely good. There's a study, and you know, the reason I've been thinking about this sort of brain as being the biggest contributor to chronic, you know, to spinal pain actually more recently. And there's a study I remember in my PhD that showed meditation uh, for chronic tension type headache, 300 people, so a large study, it reduced chronic ten tension type headache by over 90%. And I didn't really get it actually, you know, and now I get it actually that the reason it did that after six to 12 months was because the electricity in the brain is stabilized. And for any of you that meditate out there, if you're lying down and you're breathing in and out for five seconds, close your eyes, it might take five, 10 or 20 minutes. And then when the brain goes blank, you basically got reduced electricity and you're producing GABA. So there's two studies that show that meditation versus watching television and meditation versus reading a book, the meditation increased GABA levels. And it also um, modulates the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic as well. So it's sort of quite a good one to add. And I have added that quite a bit for patients now because not many can't lie down for 10, 20 minutes if they're shown how and why, and many of them do it now. And so it's, um, you know, and it's cheap as well. I do like to look for interventions that are sort of self-driven and cost-effective, because I think people need to take ownership and look after themselves. Now, loading. So loading is the other thing, and with discogenic pain, there are eight, nine studies which show any form of distraction, and this can include yoga poses like child's pose, downward dog. Basically, there are 60% average reduction in VAS scores. Two studies have shown a 75% reduction in discectomy rates with traction, 
And so for people with discogenic pain, that is certainly my go-to. I like it a lot. And I and this is what I did 10 years ago. I read the studies and thought, this is surprising. There's so many studies showing such high you know, reductions in pain with traction. I got a machine, I got a recliner chair, and basically haven't had pain for eight years. Now, the problem with not following that type of regime, so reduced loading is important. So, you know, stop the deadlifts, the squats. In fact, I just check if I've, yeah, you know, deadlift squats out of the questions. If you sit, sit back against the chair, so the back of the chair takes weight. And I tell every single person, recline when you read, relax, watch television, because you're unloading your neck and your back and really for one or two hours a day when you can, it's a really good idea to unload your spine because the rest of the time, we're sort of built for being upright really well. We're not actually built to be bent over because the loading from the biomechanical forces is far too great. Now what happens? Here we go. This is a patient in 2014. This is the same patient eight years later. I think she's about 42 years old. Look at the disc narrowing. And the prolapse is the least of her worries, actually. That L4-5 disc is narrowed with a lot of modic changes. And, you know, and that's why possibly grabbing an inversion table, doing it for five minutes at 45 degrees is all you need for the rest of your life may spare you a little bit of narrowing. And I think it's, and it's sort of a really good idea. Now, here's a patient. Has got relatively good discs, slightly dehydrated, but you know they're actually really good. But a very large lordosis, and that puts your facet joints much closer together. And what I actually do for these patients now is, in fact, get a foam roller and put it and get it under their buttocks and lie them on their back. I used to put the foam roller on their stomachs, on their front. That's a little bit painful. So nowadays, I actually put it under their buttocks. Uh, long ways and then they lie on the ground for five minutes a day with their knees bent and I've been doing this for two years and I've probably had 30 patients who have had good disc heights, increased lordosis and facet joint changes on their scans who have actually gone to zero pain just by doing this very simple thing. They also need to reduce bending lifting activities because if you bend into, say you bend down to the garden, then you bend back and you bend back and forward, you're just going to crash your facet joints and that's just going to hurt. So, um, you know, so we need to sort of look at all the different structures. Now, this gentleman here I saw recently over the last few months, as we can see, did an MR scan of his back, he had back pain just to exclude the discs. He doesn't have a big lordosis and that sort of, and he didn't have pain on extension. So I thought, well, probably not facet. He'd fallen over on the football field about six months ago and his EMR showed edema at one SI joint. I told him to stop playing football, stop running, don't walk for exercise, go swimming. He did all that, his pain is completely gone and he's just managed to go back to 10 minutes of playing football and starting to walk a bit. He was on salicoxin every day and his pain was when he started to see me around six, seven out of 10. And now most days at zero and he's taking salicoxin maybe a couple of times a week if that. So unloading is an extremely good way um, to reduce action potentials. And, you know, and I, as I was saying before, I like to manage patients 100 minus their age. I believe many people are going to live to 100 unless we die of cancer or accidents because of drugs and other things. And really, if you're 50, as a lot of patients are, we don't want pain management for a year or two. We want pain management basically till the remainder of their lives. We want to prevent disc narrowing. We want to prevent osteophytes occurring because that young person with disc like this at 42 becomes the spinal stenosis patient at 65. And then they have to walk bent over. And with a patient like this, with four levels of disc dehydration, fusing one or two levels is only going to delay the inevitable of pain from another level over the next seven, eight years. And if the patients are young with multi-level, they probably have, you know, they have to look after themselves far more. And, you know, people 
we've had our dogma of core strength for so long that it's bizarre and ridiculous. The studies show that core strength is no better, like ultrasound guided core strength is actually no better for you than just exercising. Randomized control studies. Most studies shows only 30% reductions in pain. And all the people I see who have had disc narrowing over a decade or two, they've all been doing core strength. Um, look, Helen, I'm going to leave it there. I think that's, um, yeah, that's time. Thank you, Girish. I think we'll pass over to John now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Girish. That was really informative. Um, there are some things I really agree with. There are some things that you and I can sort out over the next couple of years with a bit of luck. But I was asked to talk about chronic back pain from a, a practical point of view. What do you do with it? And let's face it, the last couple of years have been pretty difficult dealing with just about anything because the workload has been nothing short of phenomenal and the resources have been nothing but dwindling. So chronic back pain, what's the definition? It's either there all the time or it comes back and it goes away and it comes again. And it's amazing how many times I see a patient, they say, oh, I remember you from sort of 2006 and you never operated on them and you didn't offer them anything, but for some reason they disappeared as it went away and they come back and as Garish says, all you see is 10 years worth of change on their MRI scan. And quite often you can counsel them through that. The problem is, I suppose, the societal definition of chronic has now become either it's terrible or it's really bad or it's intolerable. So sometimes I think we've just got to get back and be boring and go back to the Merriam-Webster dictionary. But anyway, this slide here of one of my more charming patients from my time in New York probably sums up how a lot of us feel about our patients, our days and each other from time to time at the moment. Um, by way of an outline, what I'd like to talk about today is when do we send someone straight to the ED and how do we get past the registrar? How to get the spine surgeon's attention when you'd really like someone seen sooner rather than later. And I had my PA do a ring around this morning and I had a ring who I thought was the oldest spine surgeon in town. And his wait list was eight months for a new referral. And I had someone ring the new guy in town who's been back about two years and his wait was six. So I understand that it's really difficult to get in to see my colleagues at the moment. And um, maybe I can give you some tips and tricks for getting past that and getting them seen a bit more swiftly. And then how do we manage the wait for a specialist consultation? I think Garesh has gone a long way into that. And I don't know that I've got a vast amount to add, but I'll add my 10 cents worth. And then I'll do a little bit of what I believe are indications for appropriate surgery. Because I think quite often, or I hope quite often, Patients go back to their GP after they've seen a surgeon, go, look, the surgeon's recommended this, what do you think? And in the same way that I have no idea how to manage blood pressure in 2023, I suspect there are things that are happening in the spine surgical world that are quite foreign to what you guys saw when you were at med school or on the wards at various stages. So when to send straight to the public ED and how do I get past the registrar? Um, I did my house surgeon time in Tauranga, and most of the time on a Friday night, there was sort of a game of how do I stop a GP from sending a patient to the hospital because I've already got 80 patients backed up in the ED. That's a terrible exaggeration for the 90s, but you know what I mean. Um, and a couple of the GPs at one point got very sick of this and went to the then hospital superintendent, Dr. Reed, and he sat us down one Monday morning and gave us a very strong talking to. And he said, look, guys, Either the referrer knows what they're talking about and you need to see this patient, or the referrer has no idea what's going on and the patient needs you to see them. And that kind of stuck with me really well, and I wish I'd thought of it myself, uh, but I have to give him credit for that. And there are times when you may go, look, I don't know what's going on here, but I am really worried and I need a hand, and that's totally reasonable. And there are equally times you need to go, look, sunshine, you've been out of medical school for two or three years, you need to see this patient now. But for me, and sort of in the COVID and post-COVID environment and what we're seeing the public hospitals doing, um, I think sphincteric dysfunction in any way, shape or form, straight to ED. A motor deficit, I really believe they should go, but I sent someone with a foot drop the other day to the public hospital and they said, well, it's not actually myelopathy, it's not cord damage, so they can come back on Monday, which I personally thought was pretty reasonable. If I've got an ankle that is flaccid, and I can't balance on one leg, I want to know what's causing it, and I want it fixed as soon as possible. There are some patients that are so sore they require IV analgesia, and there's no way I wouldn't have thought that you could manage that in the um, outpatient setting. 
And when you've got concern regarding infection or malignancy or a, um, a si si situation that is deteriorating rapidly, I mean, those for me are all pretty reasonable indications for going in and places where you should stand your ground and tell the patient that that's what's happening. And I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about what's happening in the community at the moment in terms of getting patients in with those things. So having dealt with the registrar and got to a situation where you know it's not an acute problem, um, and here, actually, sorry, didn't know this talk that well. Here's just a reasonable little slide that you should, I think um, Helen gives these talks away, but here's a quick slide of what constitutes a true quarter equina syndrome. And from my point of view, the key things are inability to urinate. That's the key one. Um, loss of saddle sensation. Bowel disturbance is so vague because a lot of us don't ask the questions particularly well as we're trying to be sensitive. And it ranges from sort of constipation and leakage to diarrhea. But if you can tell you know, somebody in the hospital that is a complete inability to pass urine or overflow or loss of saddle sensation, I don't think anyone's going to say, look, you can't send that patient to the emergency department. How do we get the spine surgeon to pay attention? One of the sort of standard med school review jokes um, but when I was there was, um, what's the difference between an orthopedic surgeon and a rhinoceros? And it was the answer was, one's horny and charges a lot, and the other lives on the plains of Africa. So often we can be a fairly insensitive bunch, but if you want a spine surgeon to pay attention, you've got to go, like, I've thought about this and I really need your help on this. So it's how long has the pain been present? Are there any clinical signs? A foot drop, a loss of strength in the lower upper limbs, profound weakness. What tests have you got today? You know, And then what's top of your differential? Are you worried this is representative of cancer or severe root compression? Or are you just trying to deal with a patient who's blocking up your waiting room and sucking through opiate analgesics? And equally, what's the patient want? You know, it's very helpful for me on a referral. If you go, look, this patient is really interested in surgery versus this patient just wants to have a chat to you about painkillers, about how to self-manage that. And that makes the consultation as a, a consultant surgeon so much easier to sort of shape and manage that you don't want to start talking about major reconstructive surgery if all the patient wants to do is understand their problem and think about what the non-operative things they can do for themselves are. So how do we manage the wait for a specialist consultation? And this is a little bit along the lines of what Garesh was saying. Historically, training as a surgeon, it was, okay, we've got discogenic pain, we've got facet joint pain, we've got pain from nerve root irritation, or we've got pain from cortication. And I think when you're out in the community or when you're dealing with a patient that's sore, it doesn't really matter where the pain's coming from, because it could be coming from one of those sources, it could be coming from all four, it could be coming from somewhere else. So what you need to do is work out how to get them comfortable, how to manage their stress, their expectations, and their anxieties. And that in itself is a form of treatment. So it's a case of how quickly can we get on top of their pain and limit, eliminate the fear that maybe I've got a cancer here. Maybe this is going to be life-changing for me. Oh, look, this is a speed bump in the road. Yes, you're sore today. I can tell you because of X, Y, and Z that I don't believe this is either life or limb threatening. Let's see how we can get you through tonight and the weekend so that we can come up with an answer as to how to deal with this long term. And sometimes you can get so fixated on the one hot facet joint that you see on the spec scan or the bad disc that you see on the MRI scan that you miss the, um, the woods for the trees and the patient has a totally different issue um, that you just didn't consider because you've got one positive change on the scan that leads you down a rabbit hole. So from my point of view, if you can educate the patient, say, look, we've got an x-ray, we can do that here. 90% of bone cancers will show up on an x-ray. You almost certainly don't have that because you've got a normal x-ray. We can manage this pain because once we're taking 800 milligrams of brufen each morning along with some Panadol, you're not that sore and you can get through your day. Or you can bump it up and incorporate tramadol or for acute phase, you can occasionally use some dexamethasone or something. And we can get through this. But I really agree with what Garesh was saying. Yeah, um, I'd never heard it before, the habits and tablets thing, but I quite like it. Look, you can walk comfortably or you can sit in the hot tub and your pain goes away. Let's try that while we wait to see somebody 
who may be able to provide you with a long-term problem. But let's face it, by the time most of you get to see the specialist, your pain's going to be better and you're going to wonder why you went there in the first place. Um, I'd be interested to see what Garesh has to say about um, ice versus heat. I've always sort of viewed it as one versus the other, or even try ice. If that doesn't work, try heat. Um, but it sounds like he's got some fairly firm thoughts on this, and indeed probably some science to back up his thoughts on it, that perhaps heat is a better modality. And maybe yeah. that's something for question time, Garesh. Sure. Um, when we lack diagnostic certainty, it's a case of finding out what's useful and occasionally placebo is useful. I mean, I look at a number of patients who for various reasons have had centrally administered epidural steroid injections. If you look at the spine surgical literature, the blind centrally administered epidural steroid is no better than placebo. Whereas a transframinal epidural steroid for an isolated frontal disc herniation is significantly better. But a number of patients tell you, look, I got two years of benefit from this wonderful injection. The doctor sort of felt my back, found the gap between the bones and stuck it in. I don't really care as long as it works. And I'm pretty sure the patients aren't too worried about it either. Um, and a caution, obviously, early stage efficacy, particularly in the setting of opiate analgesics and things like this, has the potential to become late stage reliance. And these thoughts on changing medications on a regular basis are kind of fascinating to me as well. From my point of view, with a patient in acute discomfort who's struggling to cope, the key things are reassurance, advice to stay mobile in any way at all that is comfortable, walking, swimming, stationary bike, anything. I say, look, find something that's comfortable and do it. Regular use of Panadol, the... Um, Anti-inflammatory of choice for me is ibuprofen, 800 milligrams SR, but I know there are multiple other uh, medications out there. I find tramadol easy to dose and I don't have to carry a controlled drug script and I like not having a controlled drug script because it means I can turn a bunch of people away. Um, I've become more and more of a fan of short-term benzos for really bad pain with people who aren't sleeping, but I'm always... Um, cognizant of the lectures we got at med school from Stefan Schub, who basically said, look, benzos are the worst medicines in the world and perhaps the most addictive substances known to mankind. So I always felt somewhat guilty when I prescribed those. And the setting of acute nerve root pain with clear radiculopathy, a six-day course of dexamethasone um, has become a real go-to for me. So indications for appropriate surgery. The patient who comes back, and see his doctor, you know, the surgeon's recommended surgery, what do you think? The patient needs to understand their diagnosis and the diagnosis needs to be pretty firm. You should be able to see it on an X-ray and MRI. And in this day and age, everyone seems to get a CT spec scan, but I'm still not sure whether or not they add something to every case or whether they only have a place in certain settings, to be perfectly honest. I think it's key if you're going for surgery that all non-operative options have been explored first. And apologies for the typo there, that's very poor checking. And that the patient has realistic expectations of what they're going to get from the surgery. And I suppose the key thing in that is an understanding that surgery is the start of the rehab journey and it's not a quick fix. You know, you've got to understand we will fix the structural problem and then we need to unwind all of the other biomechanical issues that have occurred because of the structural problem, and then the psychological issues that have occurred following that um, pattern of movement or that pattern of behavior becoming ingrained. So if we take just a standard case that would come to me, and um, Garish may have some things to think about or say about this, but this to me is my ideal surgical patient. Patient with otherwise very normal looking lumbar spine, a good disc, it has a black rim, it has a white center, it sits flush with the bone above and bone below. You come down to the next one, it's slightly bigger, slightly bigger again, slightly bigger again. I look at this disc here, which is what a lot of us on this um, Zoom meeting will have, and it's a bit dark and it's lost a bit of height relative to this disc here, and it sags a bit but I don't think I can surgically fix this disc. A patient who can't rehab their way through a disc that looks like this, for me is somebody who will probably be made worse by surgery, personally. 
But a patient who can walk around with a disc that is this narrow, and remembering this is L5S1, so it should be the plumpest, juiciest disc this patient has, when in fact it's narrower than any of the lumbar discs in terms of its vertical height. Its end plates have become wavy rather than smooth. And you can see this blotchy change here, which is referred to as modic change, but somewhat cheekily or um, superficially, I describe it to the patients as a bone bruise, because I think that's something they can wrap their heads around. But a patient who has changes like this, I think is an ideal candidate for surgery, particularly if they've been out there working away, trying to enjoy life and just not coping. And I have a group of studies, both personal and using the implant systems I use, that say, that done correctly, I can get about 98% good-looking MRI or CT scan at one year. And 80% of those patients, I can get down to a VAS score of less than two at one year. A lot of patients you deal with now may be um, asking about total disc replacement. Uh, there's an Australian company based out of Brisbane that is very actively um, advertising trips to surgery, uh, trips to Germany to get total disc replacement surgery. And certainly a number of us around Auckland have started doing total disc replacement surgery in the lumbar spine. But if you look at the data, honestly, all you can say is that a total disc replacement is about as good at 10 years as a well-done lumbar fusion. But it does carry with it slightly greater risk of serious complications in the early stages, simply because you're implanting a mechanical device with movable pieces uh, that may come apart. And if it spits out the back, it'll wind up in the cord. And if it spits out the front, it'll wind up in the great vessels neither of which are particularly uh, good outcomes for anyone involved. Um, in terms of ALIF surgery, a lot more is being done in this town than was in 2009, and you may have some patients asking questions about it. Um, how do we get in? As you can see from the um, comic style uh, illustration, it's an approach at 5-1 that involves getting between the iliac veins and the iliac arteries. Um, and most of the time, that is a fairly simple thing to do. The incision itself can be quite small. And here's my yeah, usual approach, surgeon Isaac Cranshaw, displaying the fact that he can do it through about a six centimetre transverse incision that if a woman's has a caesarean scar would normally be done. And no, we do no longer do the old operation where you pull all of the small intestines out and put them in a bag on the side and then put them back in at the end of the operation. It's generally speaking a left-sided retroperitoneal approach where things are just smushed across to the right-hand side. Um, there's a series of ridiculously expensive instruments that allow you to get to the disc and do it relatively safely protecting it. And you can see here how you localize a disc, largely speaking, once you've avoided the vessels uh, using an image intensifier. And what we're trying to do here is restore the height or the gap between the bottom of L5 and the top of S1 and get as much lordosis as we can so that we don't have to hyperlordose 4, 5, and 3, 4 and jam up the facets like Garish was saying earlier. And you can see here at work with a, a pituitary rongeur to pluck out the disc, spacing it up, and then getting an angle created at the bottom here and the top of S1 here. Uh, we've presented on this over the years, and we've clearly demonstrated that restoration of lumbar lordosis at 5.1 is good for low back pain. And this is how you measure it if you're interested in doing that. Um, if we look at the Oswald Street Disability Score, which is a um, sort of classic validated um, score we use for describing back pain, um, where 100 is completely incapacitated and zero is um, completely unencumbered by pain. It's interesting that patients with a score of zero to 10 still think their pain is bad enough to warrant surgery. And certainly in this series, this is probably um, represented the fact that there were patients I couldn't talk out of surgery or for some reason um, didn't um, think they should be talked out of surgery. But you can see in the pre- and post-operative scores that you get a significant reduction if the light blue scores are post-op and the dark blue are pre-op, you get a significant reduction in your ODIs if you get a successful fusion in these patients, which you do in 98% of them. 
and it's once this is just talking about the lordosis which is probably beyond the scope of this but this I think is really the key to the ALF surgery the ability to set up the spine so that they don't have to hyperlordose the rest of the lumbar spine and they don't jam up the facets above the surgical level um, if you look at complications of the surgery um, out of 114 in the series we had three PEs which wasn't very much 18 patients reported some degree of significant ongoing pain. 12 patients had uh, significant lower limb radicular pain related to the bone graft substitute we use that can be very difficult to treat and very aggressive in the early term. And transient sexual dysfunction as you muck around with the ileo hypogastric plexus uh, resulted in retrograde ejaculation in two of the male patients undergoing the surgery, which they found very disturbing. So in summary, if you do have a patient that comes in for an ALIF, and as I say, I'm pretty sure every surgeon in Auckland and a significant number of surgeons around the country are now offering this as a surgery for low back pain. It offers a significantly greater ability to restore normal anatomical parameters, and as a result, um, significantly um, improved ability to improve patients' pain scores at the one-year interval. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions at this stage. Thanks so much, John. Um, so yes, there have been a few questions that have come in and I think maybe um, we should start because I know Giresh, you've, you've answered already a question around cold immersion and the use of cold versus heat. So it might be good to have a bit of discussion with that based on what John has said as well, if that's all right. Sure. So um, basically cold packs are fine. And some people would prefer heat packs, some cold packs, and that's just acutely put on the spine or your back, right? What I'm talking about with heat is full body heat, because what that does is give a far greater reaction in your brain to basically reduce sympathetic tone and increase parasympathetic tone. And sometimes you can use cold therapy and you know go on an ice bath, but you need to be around four degrees to get the same effect. It's very uncomfortable <laughs> and it's not readily available. So, but basically, I recommend sort of full body heat to reduce sympathetic tone. Not, but people can, and I still recommend heat packs and cold packs depending on preference of patients. So, yeah, there's certainly nothing wrong with using a cold pack at all. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, John, there was a question around your use of steroids that you mentioned using dexamethasone in the acute yeah. case. Can you just elaborate a bit more about um, how you would use it, what dose you would use and in what setting you'd be considering it? OK, so in the setting of either cervical or lumbar radiculopathy, so clearly defined dermatomal pattern pain screaming from either the cervical spine or the lumbar spine. I will tend to prescribe dex. And the reason I prefer dex is I understand the dosing better. And there's evidence to show that it gets into the CSF better than um, prednisone does. And so provided there are no significant contraindications, and I suppose the one that I'm most worried about is diabetes, because I know it can drive the blood sugars everywhere. I will go 12 milligrams for two days, eight milligrams for two days, four milligrams for two days. And then I'll warn them that a couple of days after that, they're gonna have an awful sort of almost depressive, the sky is falling and feeling and that it's purely chemical, and it's just the body's way of waking up their own steroid production to get around it. Um, and normally the issue with that too, is particularly when they're at the days of 12 and eight, you'll need to give them something to help them sleep because it does tend to make people very hungry and quite manic in a lot of occasions. But it's pretty easy, 12, eight, four, two, two, two. Brilliant, thank you. Well, that's a really good option to have. Um, Girish, you, you've answered a question um, which I think might be useful to to talk about live, just around the uh, the use of hypnosis. And I know you've written a great answer here, so it just might be worth having a little bit of a talk around um, that to everyone, if that's okay. I think probably drawing on the model, everything has a place. You know, psychological therapies, hypnosis, meditation, um, you know, counselling. They can basically, hopefully, help the action potentials in your brain. And hypnosis would be one of those offerings. And, you know, it's probably like if you could distract your brain to something else, well, that's going to help you not concentrate on your pain, right? And that's probably how it works. I quite like the meditation breathing because it's so easy. You lie down, you basically put your hands on your tummy, 
you breathe in for five and out for five and you do it for 10 to 40 minutes. And when you stretch your lungs, you actually reduce parasympathetic tone. And when you breathe out slowly, you reduce sympathetic tone. So it's the perfect vehicle to change that autonomic dysfunction in your brain and body. And that's why, you know, it's just easy. And I just like easy. Well, you know, maybe it's my Indianness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that I don't want to spend money, you know, I don't want my patients to spend money. <laughs> but it's more like, you know, if you can do something free and it works, you know, and, and for patients who don't have bath, spa, saunas, I actually get them to do the breathing with an electric blanket on, which is available to everybody. You know, during the day, put your electric blanket on, lay on the bed and start breathing. The other beauty about this meditation breathing is it turns chest breathers into abdominal breathers. And that's, uh, and I look about, I wrote a book called Brain Connections on insomnia, anxiety, and depression. And uh, about a year before I finished it, it took about three or four years, I read some papers on the GABA and meditation for GABA levels, right? And so I started basically doing it. I lay down 20 to 40 minutes. I get my cell phone on, I put it for a 20 minute timer. And when I first started, it would take at least 20 minutes for the brain to go a bit blank. And then I'd do another 20. And that's, you know, and that was quite a blissful feeling for anyone who's done meditation. Um, and then I, I, I keep doing it. Like, I've, you know, I probably do it four or five days a week, 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and it's easy. And when you lay down, your, your sympathetic tone reduces than when you're standing up. When you close your eyes, your sympathetic tone reduces as well. So it's just easier. And, you know, maybe if that doesn't work, you know, you can pay to go to learn hypnosis, you know. But I, I just think it's probably the baseline thing to advise, you know. And I, so I think for GPs, you know, the take-homes for tomorrow are really to, you know, the habits. You know, ask the patients, look, what are you doing for yourself? You know, are you doing one of these five habits? They've all been proven to reduce your stress in your brain and pain produces stress. Pain creates, increases sympathetic tone, reduces parasympathetic tone. That's why people with chronic pain have insomnia, anxiety, depression, and are pretty irritable and angry, right? So if we can modify, and, and they sleep poorly. So if we can modify that, like I had a patient, you know, seven out of 10 pain, gave them the triple therapy, six weeks later, Hey doc, yeah, my pain's fine. Hey, but I'm be sleeping really well, and my life's amazing. Thank you. You know, so it's sort of we want them out of distress to start with, because then, you know, they can do the conservative management longer, and hopefully they can cope with their lives. Brilliant. Yeah, I think, and it's about accessibility as well, isn't it? So the easier something is, the more likely someone's going to engage into it. Um, John, there's a question maybe for you to answer, which is, I mean, either of you could go for it, but I think probably from John's point of view, how long would you continue to attempt non-surgical treatment before deciding that surgery becomes more appropriate? I think it depends what the impact it's having on the patient's life. If you've got a patient with a clear motor deficit, you know, I think, you know, realistically speaking, at, you know, quarter of quina, it's 24 hours. If you've got a motor deficit, you probably give them four days. And if it's not starting to improve, then you need to say, look, you really need to start thinking about this. If it's axial low back pain, I think it's six months minimum. I really do. And it's not six months of rest. It's six months of actively trying to do something about it. You know, I went home and I put myself to bed and I took time off work. doesn't count. Uh, mm -hmm. Because a patient who's going to take that approach before surgery will take that approach after surgery and they'll become a failed back surgery patient for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, go, Gary. Stress is probably the number one reason we operate, you know, operations. People are super in pain and super distressed. And, you know, that, that's probably, yeah, a big part of, you know, who ends up because a lot of people out there with back pain, you know, there's mm. tons and tons, but. You know, many of them don't even present. You know, they they don't. Some just don't ever want surgery. Some definitely want surgery, and they sort of have this fixation that oh, I have surgery, it's gone. And you know, and sometimes that's true, but probably you know, there's a spectrum of that. Yeah, um, I mean, that's where your philosophy will differ a little bit from mine, Grace. I, I 
one of my sort of questions that's become sort of pretty sort of standard for me, I say, look, what is your back costing you that you need to do to provide for yourself or your family? Or what does you, your back cost you that you love to do that makes life worth living? And if they say, look, I'm a world live, you know, world champion level triathlete, I'm like, well, I probably can't help you. I probably can't get you back to that. But if they say, look, I'd like to be able to go out in a six meter boat on the Harry off and slap around and chop, I say, look, you give me a year, I can probably do that. Yeah. And then the other thing I'll say to people is, you've also sort of got to put in, say to yourself, well, you don't need spine surgery, almost no one needs it, because most of the problems we deal with aren't going to kill you or paralyze you. But you say, um, either at some point you will change your life to fit your back or you'll change your back to fit your life. Once you've, as I say, once you've mastered the fifth column, once you've mastered your, your psycho neuro hormonal axis, and that takes some doing, I agree. And it's a very difficult um, access to treat in this country, like trying to find a pain therapist who can get through to your average Kiwi bloke and not make him feel like he's been told he's going nuts is a very hard thing to do in this country. And I'll talk about about 10 years ago when I had back pain for a couple of years. So I used to kayak, I had two kayaks on, and I used to be in Wellington and Sea Team, so I'd kayak every day. I used to do road, uh, road cycling around Lake Taupo and make furniture and do a lot of woodwork. Basically, sold the kayaks, sold the cycle, all the woodwork's gone. Mm -hmm. and, and I've modified activities and do other things. And for personally, because I've got four levels in my spine, I don't think for me that it's, you know, being 45 ish at the time, it wasn't going to work. So I no. sort of, saw, and, I, and I think this is, it's almost like, you know, do I want to give myself a cup of tea and not walk bent over at 75? Yeah, and I think looking at your MRI, you made a good choice. I don't think anyone could have got you back in a kayak. I really don't. Yeah. I used to have for almost five years, I'd go kayaking, I'd get tingling down both legs, and I'd sort of go like this off the kayak, and I'd go away and I'd sit back down at his back after 10 mm. minutes. I sort of thought, am I sitting on my sciatic nerves? Or, you know, I just didn't know. <laughs> and in fact, all, you know, so, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's horses for courses, and I think and I think, as you say, I don't think though patients are quite counselled well enough for what may be in 10, 20 years. And that's what I've sort of spent a lot of time sort of trying to piece together is how do I counsel patients, you know, not just for the next five, 10 years, not just for the next, you know, TFI in a year or whatever, yeah. but how do I counsel them beyond that? And I think, yeah, and I've also done a lot of, I'm, I'm honorary at the engineering school, actually. And so I've done a lot of biomechanics and, and stuff with them, which is sort of, yeah, just given an insight into that body of knowledge, which, you know, then pieced it together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a really good point you've both made is that you look beyond the scan to the patient and what, what you're aiming for and what is the outcome that you're wanting and that help di helps direct what the decision yeah. making that you have. Um, which leads me on to a question uh, around post-operative care, John. How important do, or how much do you emphasise to your patients prior to surgery what they need to be doing in the post-operative phase in terms of their um, recovery and their engagement in these habits? So that's a real area of interest for me, um, you know, and it's different for different stages of life and different sorts of people. I mean, I think one of the biggest disservices that spine surgeons have done to themselves is the sort of old doctrine of six weeks of bed rest. I had a mm. patient the other day who they'd had surgery in the public hospital. They came to me because they just were dissatisfied with their follow-up. They had really good surgery, but, you know, they waited for two hours and seen the registrar and they said, well, you know, should I start, start physio now eight weeks out from surgery? And they said, oh, no, I'd probably wait six months for that. And, and my view would be if you've had surgery and it's been stably fixed, what you want is good, well-oxygenated blood full of nutrients being delivered to the healing site. So that means blood pressure up, heart rate up. So you need a mixture of aerobic activity to get that happening. You need appropriate strength and resistance training to get muscles pulling on bone to encourage calcium formation and bone hardness. And um, it's a really difficult thing to access here in New Zealand. You know, finding a good physio or a good chiro 
um, is not always as easy as just looking at what company they work for. Different people do different things well. And I have been for about three years trying to develop some sort of useful rehab program. And it's got no further than one piece of A4 paper and some really good people on the shore, a couple of good people in Mount Eden. I've recently found some good uh, physios in Howick. Um, but it comes down to those personal relationships. The Back Institute is doing more and more. They're setting up more and more centres around town. But I, I didn't even know they had a unit in Ormiston um, until this oh, until last week when a patient said, what about I go there? And I said, I, I thought there was one on the shore and um, one in Mount Eden, but there's one in Ormiston now. And I think the whole rehab thing is something we need to look at really closely because without it, you're, you're hopping around on one leg. And there's an accessibility issue with that as well, isn't there? Because it yeah. won't, no, it won't necessarily be funded. In no, terms well, of that's why often ACC patients are better than insurance patients, which is the opposite of anywhere in the world, because ACC will pay for physio and insurance won't. Yeah. So one how? The, uh, yeah. One Sorry. Of the, one of the things I tell my patients, especially some are hip and back and some are combined, is generally speaking, going to walk up and down a swimming pool for twenty to thirty minutes. And most swimming pools have saunas and spas and things. So, you know, and that probably will fulfill some of what John's talking about. And, and that way they can't hurt themselves because I find that's a bigger problem, actually, that they'll go and be made to do things that actually hurt them. And, and I think, you know, sometimes they've got hip pain and they've been in back pain and they'll be said, oh, you need to walk, you know, and they're sort of, and, I, and I've seen this too many times. So, I quite like that as possibly a good holding tool till you find the appropriate person and it, it won't harm anyone, but it'll keep them moving and keep their sympathetic tone at bay. Brilliant. There's, um, there's a particular question here for you, John. Um, what is the full form of ALI? Could you talk to us about that? What was that? What is the full form of ALI? Oh, anterior lumbar antibody fusion. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> but I think that's just again making clear. Um, and in terms of your effusion, you've had someone write in to say thank you for the surgery that you've done on them in the past and that they don't have any pain or problems to this day. So thank you from thank someone you. in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from, from our point of view, I think there's been a few really good things that have come out of this talk that are, as you say, Giresh, you know, uh, things that we can do for from tomorrow. And, and one of them is that habits and tablets. And I, I really like that as an approach pre-surgery um, in the build-up to surgery and possibly in the post-surgical setting as well so regardless it sort of sits there nicely and I think you've both spoken to different medications that can work in, um, for different reasons um, and the habits I think are really similar to, to what both of you recommend and would use so I think being able to find something that works um, really comfortably for, for your individual patient is wonderful. Um, Sorry, I've just had one come in that says the go-to advice for pre-hospital care for back pain is mobilisation. When uh, can someone one one of you speak to when this is not appropriate? Is it just when the pain is increasing when moving, or is there anything else that we should be looking out for? John, go to Garish on that one. <laughs> oh look, I I I don't think there's been a single person I've ever seen that can't walk up and down a swimming pool. You know, really, I mean. And if they can't do that, then there's something severely wrong, which needs scanning. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty... A pathological fracture of some description, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, and I think that's almost like my, and I've had people with bad arthritis of the hip, bad spines, and I've never come across one yet that couldn't do that. So if they can't do that, there's something else, you know, wildly going wrong that needs to be investigated. And so do you think some of the approach there is trying to convince, convince people to go out and try things like that, which is probably the hardest part? Yes. I think, yeah, I think pretty much once you counsel them why they're doing it, they, they, and I've got the slideshow and I show them, look, you know, these things will help you, help you sleep a little, maybe reduce your tablet intake, and this is how it works. They're pretty keen, and I, and I think... It's that sort of people won't do things unless they know why they need to do them, right? And I think that actually has worked quite well. Um, yeah, so it's really it's really explanation, and it does take a lot of time. So it is 
a little bit difficult in general practice, actually. It is a little difficult just in the time constraints because you could probably pick up a little piece each time, maybe. You know, like you see someone, you could probably talk about tablets one day and then maybe when they come back for their ARC 18 or whatever, you might be able to talk about habits. And yeah, and the other thing I'd like to add is not everything is going to be good for someone with back pain. So yoga, if you do a sitting yoga class, it's going to hurt. You know, and so, you know, if you do a standing one, it may be okay. So a lot of this is trial and error, just like medications. So you may try it, you know, and then if you find you, the twisting, bending, like facet joints will not do that well if you're doing yoga poses, extensions, you know. So it is a sort of, yeah, not one size fits all. Absolutely. And look, I think, um, thank you so much, John and Girish, for your expertise. I think in both aspects, you know, you cross over and in terms of your thinking, and it's really interesting getting an update as to what is new and evolving, but also that approach, I think, which is more um, psychosocial and, and has more to it, um, as you say, individualized than, than um, maybe it sort of is just straightforward. So thank you again for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care. Good night.